Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the online workshop, The Carbon Element, Key Towards a Sustainable Society, organized by UCAMS, the European Chemical Society. My name is Nicola Armaroli, and I am Research Director at CNR in Bologna, Italy. And I have the honor to chair this UCAMS event on carbon. First of all, I wish to thank our distinguished speakers, also on behalf of the whole UCAMS Executive Board, for having accepted our invitation and give their valuable contribution to this uh, virtual workshop. This webinar is uh, intended to be just the beginning of a series in which uh, specific chemical elements will be discussed. Everything originates from the release of the periodic table of relative abundance by UCAMS in 2019, in an effort to raise society's awareness on the limited res uh, mineral resources of, of our planet. Our plan is to periodically update the UCAMS table, for instance, by changing the color of specific elements according to technological, economic, and geopolitical developments. Of course, this requires scientific discussion, and this is what we are going to do today. Uh, the reason why we decided to start from carbon, we discussed it in, in the board for a long time on that, is probably clear to everyone listening. The management of carbon is an essential tool to warrant a future of prosperity to present and future generations due to climate change. And the discussion on how to deal with it must go public at any level. Therefore, in this context, UCAMS is fully committed to provide its advice and expertise to European institutions and citizens. I wish to thank the people who, whose dedication and enthusiasm has made possible this event, and namely the colleagues of the Executive Board Task Group on, on the Periodic Table, Christophe Coperet, uh, David Cole Hamilton, Rinaldo Poli, and Floris Ruggis and also to the staff at the Secretariat, particularly Nineta Rastel and uh, Laura Jusse. Uh, well, now it's time to, for a few technical recommendations, both for attendees and speakers. Please, Laura, show the slide. Uh, first, for attendees, please send your question, if you have them, in the Q&A box, which is in the bottom part of your screen. Have a look and you will see it. Our speaker will, speakers will answer them live as many as possible during the panel discussions. I insist, during the panel discussions. You will be also uh, asked to answer polls during the breaks, uh, and this will uh, pop up in your screen. And uh, uh, just this will happen just before the coffee break, the first uh, question, the, the first poll, and just before the panel discussion. There will be two of them this morning and two of them this afternoon. Uh, the other recommendations are for the speakers. Please keep your cameras on during the webinar and please mute your microphone when you are not speaking to avoid background noises. And if you have any technical issue, please uh, message the administrator via the chat box dedicated to you. I want to, to uh, um, point out that this webinar is recorded. Now I leave the stage to uh, our president for uh, an introduction. Please, uh, Floris. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Um, it's a real honor for me to, uh, in my capacity as president of the European Chemical Society, to welcome all of you to this UCAMS webinar on the element carbon. And I'm very pleased to see that so many have registered and are attending this meeting and the number is still uh, rising all the time. As you may know, the European Chemical Society last year celebrated its 50th anniversary after having been established in Prague in 1970. It is an uh, overarching organization representing national chemical societies and other chemistry related organizations throughout Europe. Right now, our society has uh, 50 national chemical societies as members and from there represents approximately 150,000 chemists all over Europe. And in a world that is becoming more and more global, it is really important to, at the European level, have a platform for scientific discussion and to provide a strong and independent European voice on key policy issues in chemistry 
and chemistry related fields. Through our member societies and also our professional networks like the UCAMS chemistry divisions, the European Chemical Society is closely connected to a unique and international network of active researchers in all fields of chemistry to enhance communication and collaboration between chemists. The European Chemical Society organizes specialized academic conferences in specific chemistry areas, but also broader ones, such as the biennial UCAMS Chemistry Congress that next year will be held in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, our society also promotes the role and image of the chemical society sciences among the general public and public policymakers through, for example, social media and newsletters, and of course, through the organization of conferences and workshops that are open to, this, to society. And this is, of course, one of those. I don't have to tell you that we are facing various, very serious societal challenges. We all wish to combat disease. We are all facing the consequences of the COVID pandemic, and that requires the development of diagnostic tools, of vaccines and drugs. We have to address pollution, develop sustainable production processes, and turn our economy into a cyclic economy in which we design materials and products in such a way that they can be reused and recycled. We have the energy crisis closely connected to, to climate change, which urgently needs to be addressed and for which the input of scientists is required. That is also why on a regular basis, we wish to offer a podium to scientists, to chemists in particular, who are playing a crucial role in tackling these global problems to discuss new developments and actively participate in the discussion with politicians and policymakers to formulate new policy. Well, as Nicola already mentioned, and it's clear for you, the focus of today will lie on the element carbon, a key element in various aspects of realizing a sustainable societal society. Several of those aspects will be addressed today, and I'm very much looking forward to the lectures and discussions. And with that, I would like to give the, the word back to, uh, to the chair, to Nicola, for the, to continue with the conference. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, now let's go with the morning session. I'm going to start with a 3.5 minutes presentation, introduction, sorry, I will not be too long. My idea here is uh, sort of framing the decarbonization in terms of the short time we have to make it. And on, on the other hand, the, the huge scale we need to accomplish it. So uh, now I want to share my screen. Uh, just one moment. Uh, I have some problems, apparently. Here it is. Probably you see it. Okay, so um, the, our starting point is in Europe, are the targets that we have uh, from uh, the European Union regarding the targets of decarbonization. We know that by 2030, we have to decrease the greenhouse gases by 55% relative to 1990. And in 2050, we need to reach the, the climate neutrality. So these are very tough objectives. And uh, let me focus on the first one because it is, it is the closest one. It is the one that we have to address uh, right now already. So uh, in 1990, we emitted in Europe 4.9 gigaton of greenhouse gases. So by decreasing 55% means that we have to reach 2.2 gigaton in 2030. According to the most recent uh, data, which dates to 2018, uh, we emitted that year 3.9 gigaton. So this means that in uh, almost 30 years, we decreased only 21%. And this means that to reach 2.2, we have to uh, decrease 43% in the next decade or so. So this means practically a very uh, tough uh, target because we need to cut 
two times as much the, the, the percentage of our greenhouse gases in one third of the time. This practically means that we need to run six times faster in the next decade than we did in the previous 30 years. And so you see, this is very, very ambitious. And it's a huge challenge. And to show that's a huge challenge, I decided to uh, consider a recent global news story that everyone knows. You know what, what, what SHIP is about. It, uh, is, it weighs uh, 220,000 tons. And uh, in the average trip from China to Europe, uh, it, it takes about 30 days, 30, 35 days, passing through the, of course, the Suez Canal. This ship uh, burns in this trip, one month trip, 9,000 uh, tons of bunker fuel, the worst one, the, the most polluting one. If in principle, we convert it in hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, of course, the conversion will be technically complex. This is just an estimate to, to show you, to give you an idea of the huge scale of the effort we need to make. And uh, this means that if you want to make 3,000 ton of liquid hydrogen, which would be the equivalent of 9,000 ton approximately of the bunker fuel, we would need to make it as green hydrogen, 150 gigawatt hour of electricity. Is it a big amount? Yes, it is also because we need even more because we need to uh, electricity and energy for the liquefaction process and to keep the temperature uh, low in the, for one month. So it will be even more than that. But let's take just 150. This is the largest uh, um, uh, um, green hydrogen uh, electrolyzer powered directly by, by, by sunlight, which is based on in Fukushima. And it is clear why it is there. Uh, and this electrolyzer uh, is rated 10 megawatt and uh, the PV plant is 20 megawatt and it is big 18 hectares so 26 football fields you see you see part of them here it's, it's huge well in order to 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 provide hydrogen for that ship I showed you before and there are many many of these big ships around the world uh, it takes a long time because this facility produces 900 tons per year, per year. So just uh, this facility should work for three years continuously for just one refill of a supercar. So in conclusion for this short uh, presentation, decarbonization means on one hand a dramatic acceleration because we are, we are, we are not very close to the target right now and a process on a gargantuan scale. This is what we, we, we need to have in mind when we discuss, we discuss about car. So that's all for my short introduction. And now let's go to the first uh, speaker. And uh, I, I wish to introduce it. I am, I am very happy to introduce him. The first speaker is Professor David Cole Hamilton who following uh, degrees in Edinburgh University worked with a Nobel laureate, Sir Geoffrey Wilkinson at Imperial College on organometallic chemistry and especially homogeneous catalysis. He started his independent career at the University of Liverpool and then moved back to Scotland as professor of chemistry at the University of St. Andrews in 1985, where he became emeritus in 2014. In recent years, David served as president of the European Chemical Society. And I must say that without his passion and dedication, our endangered elements periodic table would not have been issued. So I take this opportunity to thank him so much for his hard and very, very, very successful work. Uh, please, please, David, the, 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 the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola, for your very kind words and for the invitation to take part in what looks to me like an absolutely fascinating day of chemistry about carbon. Welcome everybody to Earth Day. Today is Earth Day and so it's an appropriate day to be talking about carbon and its problems. But I'm going to talk about carbon and the UCHEM's periodic table. And every one of you, I imagine if you're a chemist, will be familiar with the periodic table. It looks something like this. Although this is a slightly unusual version because here we have one made from macrame, which is an ancient knot tying craft. And it was made by Jane Stewart and it consists of 200,000 knots and it took 350 hours to create. And it's a wonderful piece which was prepared for the International Year of the Periodic Table in 2019. 
So we recognize this as a periodic table and it, it's, we use it all the time as chemists and it really helps us in so many different ways. But if you ask a person in the street what they think about the periodic table, they'll say, oh yes, yes, I seem to remember that was something in the back of some chemistry classroom. It was sort of a yellowing piece of paper tearing at the edges. It was sort of grid thing. I didn't really understand it. And so when we came to the International Year of the Periodic Table, we decided it would be good to produce a periodic table which was different from what they remembered, something which would have a visual impact when they looked at it, and something which they would say when they said, what's that? And as soon as they say, what's that? You've got them. They get, they're pulled in. They want to know more. And so a group of us got together to try and create a new periodic table. And the group is here. Uh, the members you see, Saskia van der Wies, Christoph Koppere, Nicola, who's just been speaking, Irina Lachik, Alex Shippos, and myself. And then we had some help from Elena Lenchi, Katarina Josefowska, Josefowska, and Robert Parker. And say a word about Robert in a minute. But I particularly want to pay tribute to Nicola because he had a lot of the ideas and particularly about the shape of the periodic table. But more than that, I want to pay a uh, tribute to Suzanne Issa, who works in print and design in the university here in St. Andrews. She is the person who actually drew the periodic table. I sat beside her at a computer saying, change that color, move that line, so on and so forth. And she was wonderful, she did it all. And eventually we came up with this table here. And it isn't a table that's like anything you've seen before. It is really completely different. different. And it has a number of very, very important messages. <clears throat> the first message is in the title, the 90 natural elements that make up everything. Think about that for a moment. This whole world, all the beauty, all the diversity is made from just 90 building blocks, the 90 natural elements. Put together in different ways, they make everything. You look out of your window, you see leaves, you see flowers, you see birds, everything is made from these elements. So we really have to look after them. And then you'll see uh, each element has a different area and the area corresponds to the amount of that element in the Earth's crust and in the atmosphere. It's on a logarithmic scale because otherwise you wouldn't see the ones at the bottom here because this is, oxygen is 10 to the 23 times more than some of the ones down here. And in fact, some of them have been exaggerated so still so you can see them. So the area represents the abundance of the element. And then you see they're all color coded and we have different colors. So red means it says there's a serious threat in the next 100 years. What that means is if we carry on using these elements in the way we do at the moment, then we could disperse them in such a way that we won't have them readily available in 100 years, in less than 100 years time. So if you think, for example, indium is in the touch screen of every phone. It's used in indium tin oxide to, to make the touch screen works, conducting oxide. If you get that, that phone call from your phone company, which says you're due a new phone, uh, your contract allows you to have a new phone, come and get it. And you go and get that new phone and you then put the old phone in a drawer, which so many people do. More than half the houses in the UK have a phone in a drawer somewhere. The elements in that phone are no longer available for us to use. So they're dispersed in a way. No one's going to come in with a digger and dig it out of your drawer. So we've lost effectively those elements. So if we go on doing that kind of thing with our throwaway technology, we will end up with not enough indium. In fact, it's about 50 years for indium. <coughs> uh, sorry, 20 years for indium. And then if you look at orange, it's a rising threat from increased use as we use more of it, then we're going to have a problem. And then the yellow ones, there's a limited availability. And again, we made changes in what we do, may make them more vulnerable. And the green ones, there's a plentiful supply or they're recycled in nature and we don't have to worry too much about them. And then you'll see there are four elements, tantalum, tungsten, tin, and gold, which are half colored in this dark gray color. We call it black for now because that's what we'll call it later. So they are, they can come from areas where wars are fought over the mines or the proceeds of mining are used to fund wars. They're called conflict minerals. 
Now, they don't all come from there. So Tantan, for example, can come from these types of mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or it can come from Canada, where they're not fighting. So you have to make sure you use the ones from Canada. And phone companies, for example, are very good at what's called traceability. They trace the element from the moment it's mined through all the steps of its processing until it goes into the phone. And they try to make sure that they don't use tantalum from these mines. Now, then you'll see this symbol here, which is a, a smartphone symbol. And you'll see 31 elements which have the smartphone syllable on them. These are the 31 elements that are in most smartphones. Some have more, some have less, but these are in most smartphones. And you'll see that six of the ones that are red have uh, the smartphone symbol, so they're, they're running out quickly. And all four of the conflict minerals are in smartphones. And so we have to be very careful about where those come from, because if you use a conflict mineral, mineral in a smart, uh, an element from a conflict mineral in, in a smartphone, then in your pocket, you have something which people have died to produce. Now you can find out much more about this at this website here. Uh, and is it? Yeah, uh, this website, the bit.ly one here, and also in this article in Chemistry International. This periodic table is available in over 30 languages, and we're just about to introduce one in Irish Gaelic. Uh, and incidentally, you can go to this same website, you can read support notes about it, and you can play this uh, periodic table uh, video game, which I'll say more about in a moment. So this is the new periodic table. Now, I was lecturing about this one day in Tarragona, and Alessandra Quadrelli said to me, uh, what about carbon? And then she wrote to me, and here's Alessandra, and you'll see her later. She's going to lead the panel discussion uh, later in the morning. And she wrote to a letter and it said, responsible use entails responsible disposal as well as responsible sourcing. Current main disposal of carbon sources, that is mostly anthropogenic CO2 emissions, is contributing to current climate change. Carbon, therefore, should also be coded as orange. Now, orange, remember, means uh, rising threat from increased use in the periodic table. Now, what we meant by rising threat from increased use in the table was that there's a threat to its supply. But of course, that can also be interpreted as meaning a rising threat to the planet from its increased use. And that would be an alternative interpretation of that phrase. And so she says, and then this, this time, it, it means an element which has severely unbalanced planet boundaries. So this was one thing. She was suggesting that carbon should therefore be not green, but orange. And then she went on, but carbon with its safe green backdrop uh, should really be considered to be a conflict mineral because it is tied to conflict areas. So the question is, is that right? Should we do that? And her proposal, oh, this, this letter was signed by 35 people. There's Alessandra at the top there. But you'll see people like uh, Sir Martin Polyakov, an expert on the periodic table, Walter Leitner, Paul Anassis, Phil Jessup, uh, Francis Jerome, all key players in the Maurizio Perazzini, all key players in green chemistry, are suggesting that we should change this. And we don't see this periodic table, as Nicola said earlier, we don't see it as in tablets of stone. It's a working, it's a living document, and we should change it if things change. So her proposal was that carbon should be like this. Now I want you to think about that just for a moment and while you're thinking about it I'm going to show you an investment because you need a break. I know you can only have an attention span of three minutes. That's what Sesame Street tells us. So you need a break and here's a little advertisement but think about this. Should we change the periodic table? And this is for the video game I told you about which is a really great fun game but fun to play very easy, it's free to download from this uh, link at the bottom here. You learn a bit of chemistry, you can do some fun stuff. And uh, this is lovely. I love this bit here where you float and then you can do some surfing. So should carbon be orange, as, as Alessandra proposed in her letter? Well, when we think about carbon, the, one of the main uh, areas we're very concerned about at the moment is carbon dioxide. 
Carbon dioxide, of course, is uh, fixed by plants by photosynthesis in the presence of sunlight. And you get this reaction here, which teaches carbon dioxide and water into sugar and in glucose and oxygen, photosynthesis. That's what happens in the daytime. In the nighttime, plants reverse this and they respire. So they take up oxygen, they burn the glucose they formed, and they make carbon dioxide and water. And this should be perfectly imbalanced. And that's why you can have a terrarium, which is a closed vessel with all the plants in it. And this is called homeostasis. If the carbon dioxide level rises, plants grow better, they grow more lushly, they take up more carbon dioxide. If there's less carbon dioxide around, they grow less well, and uh, that um, doesn't remove so much oxygen. So we have a balance. And in that case, that's a good thing. We should also remember that the other form of oxidized carbon is carbonate, and calcium carbonate makes up 4% of the Earth's crust. So there's an enormous amount of carbon in oxidized form around, and we would therefore have said it is a plentiful supply and is naturally recycled and therefore should be green in the periodic table. But things are happening which are making this not quite right. So deforestation, this is a picture burning in the Amazon rainforest where they're clearing the field, clearing the forest to make places you can grow crops. We burn fossil fuels. These are cars. Actually, they're not burning because they're in a traffic jam, but normally when they're driving, they're burning at an alarming rate, and that increases the CO2 in, in, entering the atmosphere. Homeostasis breaks down. There isn't enough plants to suck up. There aren't enough plants to suck up all the carbon dioxide, and we see this rise in carbon, carbon dioxide levels from below, from around 300 parts per million to 410 uh, over the last 60 years. So we have an increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide. And as you know, that leads to an increase in temperature. And the important thing about this graph is the rising carbon dioxide in blue precedes the rise in temperature. Previously, that's not been the case, but this is. And this is very strong evidence that this particular event is causal, that the CO2 contributes to this. And this has led Greta Thunberg, for example, to become very eloquent and to mobilize children to be aware that this is a real problem for them uh, and for their successes. So she says, you've stolen my child, my dreams, my childhood. And it's true because here you see the Alaskan sea ice is complete, sometimes completely melts. Here's a glacier in Alaska which has disappeared. And even in Switzerland, in Pizol, here is a, a picture of a glacier which has disappeared. So we have a serious problem with global warming. There was the Paris Agreement in 2015, which committed us to those uh, targets that Nicola was talking about before of carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, and we have too much carbon dioxide. What about the fossil fuels that I mentioned a moment ago? Do we have too much of them? So here we have projected lifetimes. And you'll see that carbon dioxide, as I mentioned already, there's a, an almost infinite amount because it's being recycled all the time but it is increasing in the atmosphere. These numbers here are the projected lifetime in years from the BP Statistical Review of Energy, about 50 years for oil and gas, 130 for coal. So should we make carbon orange? That's the question. It's a serious, is it? A ser well, you could say here, it's a serious threat in the next 100 years. But of course, well, well no, let's just actually deal with this one first. So this is, it's large, it's increasing, and I think we can say there is a plentiful supply there, so we should have that green. These ones, um, we have to think a bit more carefully. These numbers have hardly changed in 30 years. I've been talking about this problem for 30 years, and these numbers remain the same because they find more resources, uh, and we use them, at a, although at a, an increasing rate, not so much as to increase, uh, decrease this lifetime. In addition, we have to reduce consumption of these. So they probably will last longer than 50 years and probably longer than 100 years. In fact, they should last much longer because we should leave them in the ground. However, there is the threat to the planet in the next, um, uh, the rising threat to the planet. So I think it is appropriate to color these uh, orange. Now, what about black? Should carbon be black? Well, here's a, a different, a differ uh, sorry, uh, Black, of course, is com elements from conflict minerals. Here's a definition by Earthworks. Many definitions out there. 
and their resources that are mined and used to influence and finance armed conflict, human rights abuses and violence. Well, in a way, what that means is that either wars are fought over the ownership of the mines or the proceeds of the mine are used to fund wars. And there seems little doubt that that happens here. Uh, Iraq attacked Kuwait because of its oil in 1990. And this is subsequently when they started burning the oil fields in Kuwait. The Houthi rebels uh, from Yemen attacked Saudi Arabia Aramco in 2019, attacking the oil fields again. And the destruction of Yemen is being funded by oil revenues from Saudi Arabia. In addition, ISIS was largely funded through oil revenues from fields that they, uh, they took in Iraq and Syria. Mostly they're now lost, so they don't have that source of revenue, but they were able to do an awful lot of destruction as a result of having that oil. And, Wikipedia, even, and we're not the first people to suggest that carbon might be a conflict mineral. If you go to the Wikipedia page on conflict minerals, it says even petroleum can be a conflict resource. ISIS used oil revenue to finance its military and terrorist activities. So it seems clear that we do have to do something. And I'm going to put here two proposals, which we should discuss in the panel later, along with Alessandra's proposal, which we saw before, which was to have gray and orange only. And here's one way we have, we acknowledge that some carbon dioxide is abundant and plentiful, some carbon resources. Some are a rising threat in the next, uh, from increased use, and some are conflict, can come from conflict minerals. Now I've done it like this, and this is the definition of conflict minerals we've used, but I then suggested a possible alternative, which is to have this as a hatched uh, area here, rather than the full gray one, and I put here unethical mining or use. And the reason this is because it's not clear to me, although this may come up in the panel discussion, who it is who decides what are conflict minerals. Can we, as UCAMS, come up and say, carbon is a conflict mineral, or do we have to bring that to some other body? Uh, is it the OECD? Is it the European community? Is it the Americans? There are a large number of different people who make, seem to make this designation. I couldn't find who the real person is. So if somebody knows that, I'd be very grateful to hear. So there's another possible way of, of depicting carbon in this way. With that, I'd like to finish and, and thank again those people who were responsible for making this periodic table. And I'd especially like to thank Alessandra for alerting us to this suggestion that we might change carbon in the periodic table. I look forward to the panel discussion at 11.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for uh, your great presentation and the introduction of one of the key topics of the, of the today webinar. And um, I remember the audience that the question must be uh, sent online and uh, will be answered during the panel discussion. So please go ahead with questions to David. Now let's move to the uh, second speaker. The second speaker is Mark Schaffer. He is Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Social and Economic Data Analytics at Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh. His, his field of research include uh, emerging and transition economies, labor markets, applied econometrics, economic history, energy economics, and evolutionary theory. Professor, Professor Schaffer <clears throat> graduated from Harvard University in 1982 and holds degrees in economics from Stanford University and the London School of Economics. Professor Schaffer is fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and one of the Royal Society and of the Royal Society of Arts, and a research fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research and the Institute for the Study of Labor. He has worked as consultant for the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, the European Commission, and the UK government. Please, Professor Schaffer. Well, thank thank you very much. Um, it's a it's an, an honor and a little bit uh, intimidating to be addressing this this audience uh, and a, a group of scientists who, with great expertise in an area that I do not um, uh, but uh, hope, hopefully what I what, what I have to say will be will be useful and and and, and maybe interesting um, uh, this is this is joint work I should say with with my two colleagues Urkel Ursoy and Julian Fenema um, and I hope they'll be able to help me out uh, during the um, during the panel discussion I'm a I'm actually a kind of general purpose economist but both my um, 
both 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 my colleagues have uh, have expertise deep expertise in this area having worked in our our institute of uh petroleum engineering they they are more petroleum economists than i will ever be um okay so this is uh my my talk is about um uh, is about reserves and resources, uh, and how do how do economists think about the think about them? Uh, with, uh, if, and apply to to fossil fuels, and we'll be looking at at, at oil in, in in particular. So this is the uh, this is the outline of brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I, it's I'll start with a long run perspective, and then um, uh, I'll talk about the the terminology. And this is it, it sounds boring, but it's absolutely essential. And uh, those of you who know Know your children's literature, you'll um, you'll get the reference to to Humpty Dumpty, but I will explain when I get there. Um, I'll I'll be talking about mostly about oil, but the principles apply to all fossil fuels. Actually, they apply to to all exhaustible resources uh, in in general. Um, and I'll be uh, uh, and I'll talk a bit about uh, the uh, how this how this explains what happened to to peak oil. You might have heard about, uh, but uh, and and then I'll finish with uh, stranded assets and and uh, the notion of scarce resources and what is actually scarce. Uh, the scarce here. Okay, so the long run perspective. This is. Uh, um, uh, about a century and a half of world energy consumption, and you can see that the um, the, the 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 bottom uh, the, the 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 bottom three are are uh, coal, oil, and and natural gas, and and even now they make up the vast bulk of um, our uh, of our energy use, and of course they're all they're all carbon um, contributing to to carbon emissions. So this is a this is a very big. A very big problem, and you can see the things things are pointing upwards. Um, I'll I'll come back to that a bit at the end. Um, now, what's going on behind this is is um, is um, well, economic development. So here we have two two centuries of energy intensity, and energy intensity is defined uh, as um, energy use per unit of GDP. And so what we what what you see here is the in the process of economic development. Um, uh, countries become more and then less energy intensive. Um, and um, so you can see that um, as w once countries become, once, once they become industrialized, uh, what, what starts to dominate is, is technological change. So that energy use becomes more and more efficient or we can get uh, more and more GDP out of the same, uh, the same amount of energy input. So it's a kind of race um, and I'll come back to this race um, at, at the end when, when I, um, uh, at, at the end of my at the end of my little talk, okay. This this by this slide by the way is based on some joint work by by two of us and a and a few colleagues at the um, uh, who uh, who were then at the time um, uh, at the uh, BP Group Economics. Okay, so Humpty Dumpty economics. Um, the reference is to uh, 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 the, the 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 book Lu Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Um, it's the second of his Alice in Wonderland Alice books, um, and uh, Alice gets into a conversation with Humpty Dumpty, and Humpty Dumpty uses a word in a rather odd way, and Alice points this out to him, and he comes back and says, "When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less." Um, and and this is uh, uh, the, the the books are full of wonderful lessons, and this is a particularly important one here because an awful lot of the misunderstandings about um, uh, are we running out of fossil fuels and so forth is, is based on is based on this terminology and what do people mean? Um, so uh, uh, by well, this is a, th a three part. I'm so I'm going to try to be very, very pretty clear and this is usually how it's used. Not always, but usually how it's used. So resources, roughly speaking, are what we think might be there. Uh, recoverable resources are we think what we think might be there and technically extractable. Um, reserves are what we think might be there and technically and economically extractable, that is worth extracting. Uh, and a, 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 quite a bit, maybe most all of the confusion or the debates has, uh, has been caused by failing to distinguish or be clear about the difference between recoverable reserves and um, sorry, recoverable resources um, and reserves because of the the this this caveat here, economically um, uh, e e extractable. Uh, so um, the, here's a here's a um, 
a, a, a standard classification from which originates with the Society of um, Petroleum Engineers, uh, the PRMS classification. So for oil, oil or gas to be classified as reserves, it has to be discovered, recoverable, uh, remaining and commercial. So discovered means this is about information. Recoverable has to do with um, technology. Uh, remaining means it's still there. Okay, it's not yet extracted. Um, and commercial means it has to be worth extracting. Now, technical progress generally adds to reserves. Of course, production subtracts from reserves. Um, though, though there are technologies where, as you produce, well, and I won't go go into that. Um, new information can move reserves up or down because we can discover new fields or we can just or we can find out that a field we thought we had was promising is actually not promising and of course price and regulation and policy can remove reserves up and down because they affect whether or not a, uh, a resource is is uh, commercial to extract um, now here's a the, you, you've heard of peak oil, and here's the here's the 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 uh, the picture from from the famous paper by Hubbard in 1956, which show, which is uh, applying to the, mostly the U.S. I mean, he has this in mind, so he has uh, uh, reserves go uh, uh, production going going up and down um, over over time, and so this you can see this is quite a this is a long run a long run view. So things you know extraction in the U.S. starts in 18. In the uh, around 1875, they're about I think late 1860s actually, um, and then the the slide ends in in 2050. So he has a very long run view in mind, um, and we'll see for a while it looked really good, um, but things change. Um, now here's here's the view of peak oil from 2007. This is a nice. Um, uh, uh, there was a headline uh, in the in the independent newspaper um, in 2007. Uh, World supplies are set to run out faster than expected, warned scientists. Um, this was on uh, after the publication of the BP Statistical Review, which which um, uh, David Colt Hamilton uh, referenced. In fact, I and my two colleagues work closely and reg uh, regularly with with BP Group Economics on the production of their statistical review. So the slide that he put up um, about uh, with with um, uh, reserve production uh, ratios, so those numbers, we we help uh, we help produce those numbers. Um, so the um, the the head of the Oil Depletion Analysis Center is quoted in this in this article from the Independent newspaper. Um, it's quite a simple theory and one that any beer drinker understands. The glass starts full and ends empty, and the faster you drink it, the quicker it's gone. Now this. This sounds sensible, it sounds right, and maybe it's okay for recoverable resources, but this is not how reserves work. So let's take an extreme scenario. So there are no new discoveries and no two tech, new technology. As oil is used up, it becomes scarcer. As it becomes scarcer, the price goes up, okay? And as the price goes up, that means that resources recoverable resources, which were previously uneconomic to extract and therefore not counted as reserves, are now economic to extract and count as reserves. So as you drink the beer, the beer glass gets deeper. Um, okay, so let's let now let's look at let's look at what's happened over the past the past few decades. Um, here's a, a slide again from the BP Statistical Review of World Energy. And again, my, my two colleagues and I helped help actually produce these numbers. Um, so in 19, in, at the end of 1999, um, uh, total world reserves as then reported was uh, close to, um, uh, thir well, uh, there's, there's a lot of thousand million barrels here, thir uh, almost 1,300,000 million barrels. Um, uh, uh, 20 years later, there's more. Okay, what's at, what's happened is this: we've we've uh, produced, consumed um, uh, between six and seven hundred uh, thousand million barrels, but we've added over uh, one thousand thousand million barrels to total reserves. So we actually have more in reserves than we did 20 years ago. Okay, so what's 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 going on here? Well, was Hubbard right? Um, you can see that um, for you know he's making his predictions around the, 19, the mid 1950s, um, and uh, until the end of the um, millennium, he's doing really well. Now, if I I mean honestly, if so, making a prediction which is you know this close, 50 years into the future, is doing really really well. Uh, but then look what happens to U.S. oil production, and this is the so-called uh, uh, shale, uh, shale oil or tidal oil revolution. Um, so what what actually what actually happens um, on the supply side? Sustained high oil uh, high prices of oil 
lead to incentive, give us incentives to develop new technologies and to do exploration and search for location resources and so forth. Um, on the other hand, if you have sustained low prices of oil, which is sort of where we've been for the past eight years, six, eight years, something like that, um, expensive fields are removed for sure from, from economic reserves. And so now with the shale oil revolution in the US, the technology matured, was deployed on a large scale starting in the 2000s. Um, and even at low prices, newer and cheaper fields are added to reserves because of these new technologies. Um, on the other hand, um, expensive fields, so like Canadian oil sands, are now unlikely to be developed. So we have to subtract them from, from reserves. Um, now, what's going on on the demand side? Um, so we're coming back to, um, uh, coming back to, to where, where, where I began. Um, we've got economic growth in the developing world versus efficiency gains um, in, uh, de in the developed and developing world. Um, so decarbonization is going to remove reserves by shifting demand. So we're going to, we're, we're uh, lower demand for fossil fuels, lower prices received by, uh, by the owners of these resources. Um, so, uh, and so we should have, we should have uh, lower reserves because we're the, the most expensive stuff to extract, we will not extract. Um, and this leads to the notion of stranded assets. Um, under climate commitments, we should not burn, we cannot burn um, all proved reserves. Um, this, there's a series of papers by McLeod and Ekins, which are, which, is, which are excellent that I, uh, we, we recommend. How should, uh, and so we have an interesting uh, valuation question. How should we value these reserves if we've already identified more than, than we um, intend, to, uh, intend to use? Um, now, here's, this is a slide from, um, uh, from the Graydon Elkins paper. Um, um, a, a very large fraction of the of total reserves, this is as of 2010, is, un, is unburnable. Um, how should we value these, 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 uh, these, these assets? Um, it's uh, uh, I, uh, conscious of time, so I won't, won't go into, into, into detail there. Um, so coming back now, to, 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 to finish up, um, um, uh, e economic growth in the developing world is pushing demand up, but improvements in energy efficiency is moving in the opposite direction. Now, this is, I think, the, 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 the key to the, the key points. In, the OEC, in OECD countries, uh, energy consumption per capita is about 180 uh, gigajoules. And the world pop uh, the population of OECD countries is 1.3 billion. In the non-OECD, energy consumption per capita is about a third of that. And the population is 6.4 billion. Okay, so the, the, to, to, to our minds, the, the key issue is not it, that the OECD countries reduce their energy consumption, although of course that would be contribution. It's, to, it, it's going to be to enable the non-OECD countries to not increase their energy consumption as they get richer, as they, as they industrialize and develop to anything like the levels that we have now, because if they do, uh, well, basically we're doomed. Um, now, uh, and this is, this is uh, our, my, my colleagues and I came up with this slide uh, completely independently of the, uh, uh, not knowing anything about the the paper the the letter uh, sorry signed by by written and signed by Alessandra uh, Quadrelli and, and colleagues, um, but we end up at exactly the same place, which is I find, I find which is very nice, which is heartening. All resources are scarce, say economists, but the the key scarce resources now are the are the capacities to absorb CO two emissions and to transition to new low carbon technologies and to mitigate the consequences of climate change. These are the care, scarce resources now. Um, and uh, okay, so um, right, um, they, we have, we, we will take questions, but I guess the, the questions are for the panel. So um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Schaffer, for this uh, uh, presentation, which is very interesting for us poor chemists. And the economic perspective is always important. Now we move to the next speaker, and I'm glad to uh, introduce to introduce um, Professor Pierre Friedenstein, who holds a chair in mathematical modeling of the climate system at the University of Exeter in England. He is also a research director at the CNRS in France. He has nearly 30 years of research experience in the field of global carbon cycle modeling, 
Global Biogeochemical Cycles and Global Climate Change, in which he published over 180 papers. Professor Friedlingstein leads the Global Carbon Budget, which is an effort that provides reliable carbon cycle information to assist international climate policy. He has been actively involved in IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and is going to talk to us about the carbon cycle in the, Anthropoc in the Anthropocene. Please, uh, Professor Friedlingstein. Thank, thank you, and well, thanks for inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. Uh, hopefully this is gonna work straight away. Okay, just, can you confirm that you are seeing my screen and my slides? Yes. Yes, we can see it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to give you an overview on what well, the global carbon cycle and in the Anthropocene, I mean, the human perturbation on the, the global carbon cycle. And I will, I will mainly focus on, on the emission side of it. I mean, because I suspect this is what is most interesting for the audience. Uh, so I will present, I mean, the CO2 emissions from, well, mainly from fossil fuel and how they change over the last well, 50 years, how they change in 2020, what's, what to expect in the near future. And I'll say a bit about I mean, the response of the global system, mainly atmospheric CO2 and, 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 the, and the natural things in, 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 in the global carbon cycle. So as, as you mentioned, when you introduced me, I mean, I am, I'm leading an effort, which is the, the release of the annual estimate of the global carbon budget, so we, we assess, we gather information and data sets across the world. It's a massive effort. It I mean, represents, I mean, a team effort of like 80 people all together. And we get emissions of fossil fuel from countries on an annual basis and estimation of land use changes from deforestation and also, I mean, reforestation and forestry growth and atmospheric CO2, of course, and then we have people trying to model the fate of the CO2 in the land systems, in ecosystems, and also in the ocean, in the ocean uh, systems, the, the, the global ocean carbon cycle. So this is published every year, and all the data are available. I, I mean, give the links to the website of the publication and all the infographics and well, most of the thing I'll be presenting now is actually available on uh, on, on this website and they're and free to use. So the starting point, of course, is atmospheric CO2. So this is a CO2 as measured in the atmosphere. Uh, this is from Mauna Loa in Hawaii. This is the longest record we have. We did this start in 1958, initiated by Dave Killing. And what you what you what you see, and what, well, I'm pretty sure all, all of you know, is I mean, the long term increase in CO2 in the atmosphere uh, over the last I mean 60 years, it's in, it increased by about 100 ppm, so 100 parts per million. We are reaching now uh, well uh, more than 400 ppm, 410 ppm in 2019. Uh, well, 50, I mean, 50 percent higher than what it was at pre-industrial, which I can show on my next slide. There's like a long-term view of the carbon cycle. We have ice cores, uh, mainly in Antarctica, also in Greenland. They can, I mean, actually record and we can measure CO2 in air bubbles all the way up to almost one million years. And you see the, I mean, the natural viability of the carbon cycle from glacial to interglacial cycles up to, well, let's say 10,000 years ago. And then if you look at I mean, the, the, the far right end of the graph, you see the rapid increase in CO2. And with little I mean, uh, arrows, I mean, telling you where it was in 1960, 1980, 20, I mean, 2000, 2020. And you see that the increase, the current increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is something which is completely unprecedented over at least, according to ice core, at least 800,000 years. Of course, as mentioned already, I mean, CO2 I mean, carbon dioxide is the main driver of climate change. It's not the only one. I mean, there's also methane, N2O, CFCs, aerosols contributing to the warming, but these are second player compared to CO2. 
just to make it clear, natural forcing like the solar availability, volcanoes, etc., they play no role in long-term warming. They play a role in short term variability, they don't play a role in long-term increase in temperature. I mean, it does increase as you see it uh, on, 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 on the slide. This is from the NASA. Uh, data set, but I mean, the same is available from different data sets across the world. And I mean, as of today, we reach a warming of, I mean, more, I mean slightly one, more than one degree already. I mean, I mean, the, the baseline on this slide is, is, is the 1960s, 1970s. This is why, I mean, it's not as warm as it would be, but if you start from pre-industrial, the warming today is about 1.2 degrees already. As I said, well, the, 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 the reason is the increase in CO2. And if you go back to the reason of the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, of course, is due to CO2 emissions. This is the long term, long term view of the emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere from the main drivers, production of coal, oil, gas, and also, as mentioned before, land use change, deforestation. And as you can see on the graph, initially, I mean, in the 19th century, most of the CO2 emitted into the atmosphere was due to land use change, but this rapidly changed. And well, fossil fuel became dominant uh, well, around 19, 1950 or even slightly before 1950. And at present, I mean, emission from fossil fuel represents about 90%. 90% of the total emissions of CO2 from human activities. Land use is still significant, but it's only about 10% of the total emissions at, at present. If I look in more detail in the fossil fuel emissions, I mean, this is again, emissions of, of CO2 from fossil fuel combustion over the last, I mean, two years. And you see that it's been increasing steadily uh, over this period, I mean, the growth rate of CO2 went from about 1% per year in the 90s up to 3% per year in the, um, the, the first decade of the 21st century. And now it's back to something like 1% increase per year, but it's still increasing every single year, okay? Except for some exceptions. And of course, one of the major exceptions, as we know, is last year, 2020, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic which massively reduced, I mean, consumptions and the for produ production of CO2, there was a recorded drop of CO2 emissions. And we estimate that, I mean, CO2 emissions in 2020 were about 7% lower than in 2019. And just to put this in perspective of other uh, small exclusion of CO2 emissions, you see that, I mean, this is the largest emission reduction we've seen well in essentially in human history in, in uh, for, for CO2 emissions the global financial crisis in 2007 only uh, reduced emission by about two percent for the for for like a couple of years and then it quickly recovered so the drop we've seen in 2020 seven percent is is huge uh, the reason for the drop as i mentioned earlier is I mean, reduced consumptions because, I mean, essentially a large majority of the population was in, in lockdown at different time in the year. It starts with China, then it, then it, it moved to, to Europe. Uh, some countries in Europe start earlier, some countries in, in Europe like went a bit later. And then in the US as well, they had lockdown in, in different states. All of this has, of course, major impact on Conceptions. I mean, surface transport, as you see on, on, the, on, the, on the right plot, surface transport was massively reduced in 2020 compared to like a normal year. Industrial productions uh, and, and election, uh, electricity production as well. Aviation, of course. I mean, aviation is relatively a small sector in terms of total emissions, but I mean, the reduction in emission from aviation was, 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 ma was massive. And altogether, as I said, this led to a reduction of about, I mean, I mean, 2 billion tons of CO2 compared to previous year, which is about 7%. As I said, it happened in well, most countries across the world. And on this slide, you see and the change in CO2 emissions from 2018 to 2019, which was before COVID-19. And you see that, I mean, China was responsible for an increase of, I mean, po about 0.2 billion tons of CO2. I mean, the USA was slightly reducing, EU was slightly reducing, India and the rest of the world were slightly increasing. 
this is for 2019. And if you look at the right side of this graph, you see the difference between 2020 and 2019. And you see the, you see the massive drop in 2020, where emission, total emission were about, as I say, 34 billion tons. And you see that, I mean, this is due to a decrease in every single region of the world. I mean, China, US, EU, India, and the rest of the world, every single region in the world had a strong decline in their, I mean, national emissions in 2020. And again, this is, a, I mean, showing the same story. And you see on, 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 uh, at, the, at the top, at the top end of each of these lines, each line represents a region. Uh, in orange is China, in green USA, blue EU, and purple India. And then we put the rest of the world all together in the second black line is the rest of the world. And you see that there is a little drop in 2020 for each of these regions, but still, the drop, the drop in 2020 is relatively small compared to the long-term increase in emission that we've seen in most of these countries. And if you take, I mean, well, the rest of the world, you see that the drop brings emission back to where they were maybe like three, four, five years ago, maximum. China, the, the emission drop brings emission back to where they were maybe two years ago. And of course, for, I mean, EU, I mean, the drop just in uh, prolonged the current trend, as mentioned already, I mean, the trend in the EU is negative. The emissions are reducing from every year, from year to year in the EU. And, and the drop was like, well, a larger reduction than what you see normally, but it was still a reduction, of course. Uh, many people expected to see a direct effect of this emission decrease in the atmosphere. And the short answer is no, there is no impact there is no direct impact of this 7% reduction in, in that of CO2. We do measure CO2 in the atmosphere, and these are the latest data taken from the, from the NOAA website a few days ago. And you see that you can't see a difference. If you look at 2020, on the left side, on the left panel, you have, I mean, the black line is the low term trend. The, 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 the red lines are, I mean, the seasonal cycle of the CO2, you don't see a difference between 2020 and 2019, it's still going up. And if you look at the right hand side, this is the annual increase of CO2 from year to year. So every little blue line is the increase compared to previous year. And you see 2020 at the end, it's, it's very high, it's as high as 2019. It's about 2.5 ppm per, uh, per year. So the increase in CO2 in 2020 was actually 2.6. And um, it's comparable to, I mean, what we had in previous years. There's also variability, but you don't see a massive drop. And the reason is that the, the, the system is very complex. When we emit CO2 in the atmosphere, only about 50% stays in the atmosphere. The rest is taken back by the land and the ocean. This is what we call the land sink and the ocean sink, as you see on the right hand side of these plots. And only as I said, only half of the CO2 stays in the atmosphere. And on top of that, as you see, there's lots of variability from year to year uh, in the atmospheric CO2 growth rate in the atmosphere. Sometimes it's almost as large as the emission, sometimes it's much, much lower. And the reason is the land carbon cycle, the land sink are extremely variable from year to year. And this variability is actually much, much larger than the small excursion we see in the emissions. And if emission drop by a few percent, depending on what the land sink is on that given year because of climate conditions. I mean, the, 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 the anthropogenic signal is completely dwarfed by the variability of the system. And this is, I mean, uh, uh, highlighted in this, in this graph. So the, the atmospheric CO2 is, the, of course, is the net balance between what we emit in the, in the atmosphere and what is being removed by the systems. So it's the balance between the emissions and the things. And on this slide, you see, again, we figure year by year, 2018, 2019, 2020, you start with your CO2 in the atmosphere in 2018, which was like 400, I mean, 400 or 7 ppm. You emit CO2 from fossil fuel and from land use. Each of these contribute to an increase that we can, I mean, convert from emissions into ppm, into parts per million. And then there is a land sink in the ocean sink. And at the end of the year, in 2019, you end up with more CO2 for 409. If you do the same in 2020, the emissions were lower. 
as opposed to init 4.6, we only emit 4.3 ppm. Land use was about the same. The land sink was slightly different. The ocean sink was slightly different because of the natural system and the state of the climate system in 2020. And you end up with a CO2 in atmosphere, which is 412.4. So again, CO2 is still increasing. The drop in emission is not strong enough to induce like a reduction in the CO2 or even like a reduction in the growth rate of CO2. Okay, what's, 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 I will finish with a few slides. I'm just saying what, what can we expect for I mean, the current year, 2020, 2021, and how, I mean, where does this put us in terms of long-term, I mean, mitigation effort, which was mentioned in, 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 the, in the introduction. This is a new data, I mean, from, coming from IEA, and they were, they were published this week. And this is the projection of the global economy for 2021. And this is the change in GDP, this is the world, G the world GDP. And on the, on the left slide, you see I mean, the annual rate of change in GDP from year to year. You, of course, you see the massive drop in the GDP that happened in 2020 because of the pandemic. And the, 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 the red bar on the, on the left side is the projected increase for 2021. And the IEA is projecting a massive rebound of the global economy in 2021. Of course, this is a projection for the whole year. It's still depending on what's happening at the moment, but this is the best projection we have at the moment. So the GDP drop in 2020 will be, I mean, I mean, countered by like uh, a strong rebound in 2021. And this is happening in all regions. On the left, on the on the right hand side, you see 2020 versus 19, 2021 versus 2020, and I mean, I mean the, the difference across I mean the two years for the world in the red dot and for each region. And you see in 2020, there was a reduction in most countries, except for China in 2021, unexpected recovered for most countries, in, well, of course, including, including China as well, of course. And if you try to convert this into emissions, and I won't spend too much time, but I mean, the, the, the projection from the IEA is a 5% increase in emission in 2021 relative to 2020. So if you remember, emission dropped by 7% in 2020. We expect them to recover almost to the level they were before, the, the pre-pandemic in 2019. So they would be recovered by about 5%. 5 this is driven by large increase in coal and oil production, especially in Asia for coal. And something I'm not showing, which is a bit of a good news, the renewable energy production is also increasing massively in 2021, as it did in 2020. This is one of the sectors that didn't decrease uh, during the pandemic. Just to say where this is, I mean, put, putting us in the long term, I mean, these are, I mean, emissions of CO2 uh, across the 21st century. And as mentioned earlier, I mean, if you want to reduce warming and to keep warming within either 1.5 or 2 degrees, I mean, emissions have to I mean, start reducing massively in the very near term. And these are the, I mean, the, the purple and the bluish lines on this graph. And oppositely, if emissions continue to increase or only stabilize much later in the century, I mean, the associate warming would be more like about well, above 2 degrees, 3 degrees, or even, I mean, 3 to 5 degrees, if you have a baseline with increasing CO2 emissions across the whole century. Uh, this is essentially saying the same story. On the left side, you see, I mean, emission pathways and uh, current emissions are about 50 gigatons, and this is including all greenhouse gases, not just CO2. This is why these numbers are higher than the one I presented before. I mean, CO2 alone is 35. I mean, CO2 and non-CO2 convert into, into CO2 equivalent, it's about 50. And well, emissions need to reduce from 50, I mean, all the way to essentially zero in, well, in the second part of the century. And the, the right end slides, I mean, uh, uh, so uh, figure sorry sorry shows you emission reductions needed i mean starting from different time in well either in the past or in the near future and of course i mean the late the, the, the more you wait until you reduce emissions the steeper the decline has to be in order to be consistent because it all comes down to the recent amount of co2 that you can emit in the atmosphere to keep warming below either 1.5 or 2 degrees. These are the numbers for 2 degrees. And these are the number for 1.5. Of course, 1.5 means less CO2 uh, allowed to be emitted. And therefore, 
I mean, more drastic uh, emission reduction in the near future. And just to, I mean, to, to finalize, and this is, I mean, I mean, just to come back to what was presented in the introduction of this session this morning, these are the CO2 emissions from EU, from the different components. Uh, 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 in black, it's oil. So I mean, uh, oil, oil productions. In, in brown, it's uh, coal, sorry. And blue is gas. And the little uh, gray is, is cement production, but I mean, the main three, I mean, fossil fuel emissions, uh, coal, oil, and gas are the, the, uh, the three top ones. And emissions in, in, in Europe are declining, as we said, and this is mainly thanks to the strong decline in the coal production, which is the brown line. And this is the one where you can see that we can achieve probably net zero in, in the coming decades. For the other two, the black line, which is oil production, and the, the blue line, which is gas production, you see, I mean, the long arrows that I created myself that shows you where you need to be if you want to be net zero by 2050. And this is where the challenge is for EU, is to bring down the emissions from oil, which is mainly transport, and gas, which is mainly energy production, all the way down to zero in the, next coming, in, in the coming decades. So just to conclude, as I said, I mean, fossil fuel emissions have in, increased over, well, human history, including 20, 20, 21st century, with the exception of, I mean, every, every few years, we reached 34 gigatons CO2 per year emissions over the last decade. We observed a decline in 2020 due to the pandemic, large decline in many countries like EU and US, but expect, expected uh, rebound in 2021. And of course, I mean, the one, the longer term will depend on, I mean, I mean, policies and green deals. And there is, of course, a need to decrease emissions massively by about one to two gigatons CO2 per year, which is about the level of emission reduction we've seen for during the pandemic. We have to do this kind of reduction every single year over the coming decades to limit warming well below two degrees. Okay, I will finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Friedenstein, for this uh, presentation. And uh, we look forward to discuss with you during the panel session later on. So uh, let's move to the next speaker. The next speaker is from the US, so he couldn't be here due to time zone uh, constraints, let's say. And uh, so he, you will see a, a, a video from him. Uh, the next speaker is Jeff Colgan who is the Richard Holbrook Associate Professor of Political Science at Brown University and Director of the Climate Solutions Lab at the Watson Institute of Public and International Affairs. His research focuses on international order, especially as it relates to energy and the environment. His forthcoming book is Partial Hegemony, Oil Politics and International Order. It will be published by the Oxford University Press next year. October, and we look forward to reading it, of course. And uh, please, uh, uh, Laura, um, provide the video of Professor uh, Kogan. Hi, my name is Jeff Colgan. I am a professor and the director of the Climate Solutions Lab here at Brown University. And I'm delighted to have this invitation from the European Chemical Society to speak to you today about the geopolitics of carbon, uh, especially today uh, as it is Earth Day on uh, 2021. So uh, happily, when we think about the periodic table of elements that the European Chemical Society put together, identifying which ones are scarce and which ones are abundant, happily carbon is not one of the scarce ones. Uh, it's abundant on our world, it is the basis of all life, uh, and so that is uh, good news for us mostly. But some forms of carbon are unfortunately dangerous for our world. And in my view, the two most dangerous molecules in the world right now are carbon dioxide and CH4, or uh, or methane, right? So both of those involve carbon and uh, both of them, of course, are greenhouse gases. So they are uh, a part of the causes of uh, climate change. And I'll speak to that just for a moment uh, in a minute, but most of what I'm going to talk uh, about today 
is a, a different uh, form of a carbon, uh, namely hydrocarbons, or uh, in particular, petroleum, oil. Uh, oil is linked to uh, somewhere between a third and half of all of the international wars since 1973, depending on how you count it. Uh, and so oil, unfortunately, has really strong political effects when we think about how it generates money and the way that that money gets used. Uh, these are not politically neutral, and it tends to lead to significant conflicts in addition to a, a whole range of other problems as well, corruption, inequality, uh, authoritarianism, uh, Etc. Uh, so I'm going to spend uh, some time talking to you about that today and what I've learned over the last oh, 10, 12, uh, almost 15 years uh, of studying that topic. Before I get into that, I, I feel like I would be remiss in not saying just a word uh, about climate change, because when we think about carbon, uh, that's, the, that's the molecule we really need to be uh, paying attention to, or the two that we really need to be paying attention to, which are the drivers of what is, at the moment, the world's most pressing global problem. Right? Uh, climate change is already changing our world. We're seeing those effects in wildfires in Australia and Western United States. We're seeing uh, sea level rise all around the world. We're seeing more extreme uh, heat events. The list goes on and on. It's familiar to you, I'm sure, so I won't, go, uh, won't belabor the point. But from a political scientist's perspective, uh, I want to call attention to three aspects of that problem that make it particularly challenging to solve. Uh, the technologies that we need to solve uh, that the problem and really address climate change are mostly in place. Um, we'd like them to be cheaper, we'd like them to be more efficient, but mostly we have what we need technically to get to solutions of, of climate change. The much more difficult problem uh, are getting the politics and the economics right to, to use those technologies in our everyday lives. And of course, that affects so much of our life uh, in terms of travel, in terms of the food we eat, et cetera, that there's, there's a lot to be done. And three problems that make this difficult. Uh, one is uh, what we call collective action problems, right? That this is a problem that requires uh, solutions from a whole lot of people, contributions from a whole lot of people, a lot of different actors, corporations, countries around the world. And the temptation here is free riding, where we hope that somebody else will make the effort to clean up uh, our emissions. Uh, and therefore, we sort of sit back uh, and don't necessarily make our own contribution. Or if we do make our contribution, uh, then we have no promise, no guarantee that others will uh, do what they need to do. So that's one problem. The second problem uh, is time inconsistency, uh, meaning uh, we know climate change is going to create significant problems in the future, and the people who live in the future would like us now uh, to change our ways so that uh, we don't uh, wreck the world that they will live in. Uh, but of course, those people haven't been born yet, some of them, uh, or they're still children, uh, and uh, they don't get to vote. Uh, they don't have the sort of uh, economic and political weight uh, to make things happen. Uh, and so there's, there's an inconsistency in the preferences of those who are in power today versus uh, the, the stewardship of the world uh, in the future. The third aspect of the problem that makes it really hard is what we call carbon lock-in, meaning lots of the infrastructure and institutions and ways of doing things that we have uh, today uh, make uh, a, a continuation of fossil fuel consumption uh, the most logical choice in a lot of ways and or from a certain perspective, right, from an economic perspective. Uh, if we already have, say, coal plants already built, then sometimes the temptation is to keep using them. Uh, and pipelines in existence, well, we're going to keep using those. And so it takes some real effort to change our infrastructure, change our institutions, to start favoring uh, renewables and cleaner technologies in different ways uh, of living life. Those are some hard problems, uh, and, and uh, political scientists have started calling climate change uh, a wicked hard problem uh, in the sense that uh, there's, there's so many different aspects to it. 
but there are also solutions. Uh, and one of the things that Nobel laureate at Eleanor uh, Oster, she won the Nobel Prize in economics, even though she was a political scientist, uh, she encouraged us to think about polycentric solutions. Now, what does that mean, polycentric? It means that we're not gonna have one silver bullet, a solution at one uh, government level. Instead, we're gonna have layers and layers of different kinds of policies that will, you know, will happen at all different levels of governance, whether that's at the United Nations or at other international bodies, uh, at national governments, at subnational units, at cities, in our individual you know, communities, all kinds of different overlapping uh, efforts and policies and regulations uh, to try to move us forward uh, on climate change. And that is in many ways the most promising approach uh, to addressing this because uh, any one uh, approach, uh, as we've seen, there's no sort of silver bullet, no international solution that we can snap our fingers and make happen. In fact, if anything, we've had uh, all too many years uh, of failure at the international level. Uh, and so this is probably the, the right way to, to start moving forward. But enough about climate change, I want to uh, move now uh, to the other form of carbon that we should be thinking about in terms of geopolitics, and that of course is oil. And uh, one thing that I want to stress today is that uh, oil has different consequences politically for each country around the world, depending primarily on whether they are a net oil importer, meaning they, they buy their oil from someone else, or they're a net oil exporter. They sell their oil, right? So Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or Iraq, these are net oil exporters, or we might call them petrostates uh, because they, uh, much of their economy revolves around selling oil. Now for oil net importers, which uh, the country that I live in, the United States is most of the time, it wasn't uh, for a while last year, uh, and it might be uh, again a net exporter, but right now it's a net oil importer. Um, some of the, the ways that we see uh, net oil importers think about oil is, oh gosh, we need to make sure that we have a secure energy supply. And that anxiety around a, a, a need for a secure energy supply, in particular an, an oil supply, has sometimes caused wars or shaped the course of wars. And so we can think, for instance, back to World War II, where Japan invaded what were at the time the Dutch East Indies in search of oil and other natural resources. Uh, that's, a, that's a classic example, textbook example of the kinds of um, effects that oil might have as an incentive for war. Uh, and similarly, the Germans under the Nazi regime uh, attacked Russia in part because there was a drive to get the oil that was located in the, the Caucasus. Um, and of course, Russia mean, uh, meaning the Soviet Union at the time. The other way that access to oil can be quite important uh, is um, transit routes. And so you can think of, say, the Suez Crisis in 1956, where Britain and France uh, encouraged Israel to attack uh, Egypt, uh, in part to, to try to uh, make sure that the flow of oil continued through the Suez Canal. They were very concerned that uh, Nasser might nationalize the Suez Canal uh, and therefore restrict the oil supply to, to Western Europe. But for oil producers, for petrostates, the story is quite different actually. Oil changes the domestic politics inside the petrostate. There's so much money coming in kind of from the outside, often to the rulers, to the, the, the coffers of the, the national government that can change the nature of domestic politics. Uh, and in turn, that creates potential international security problems. So I wanna give you a few examples of uh, this, this kind of dynamic. Uh, but before I do that, let me just point out uh, when we think about, again, that I, I'm focusing especially on petrostates, the net oil exporters. Those states are unfortunately 50% more likely to get into international conflicts than non-petro states. Uh, and so this graph actually breaks that down a little bit. What you see on the, the y-axis here is militarized interstate disputes per year. Militarized interstate disputes or MIDs 
is this very um, political science-y kind of uh, phrase for um, different types of conflicts. Uh, and they actually range from one to five, five being a war uh, and, and lower level conflicts as well. And you can see on the left-hand side here that the, the light gray bar are petrostates and they get into a lot of internet, uh, into a lot of mints, a lot of international conflicts. Then the next two pairs of bars on the, the right-hand side here breaks down these different types of mids into the role that a particular state takes, either as the attacker or the defender. Uh, and there's some squishiness in this data because of course it's sometimes very hard to identify which uh, role a particular state is, is playing. Um, but one thing that's really noticing, noticeable here is that petrostates are more likely to be both the attacker and the defender, uh, unfortunately, and in particular, they are twice as likely to be the attacker, to be the instigator of a conflict. Uh, and so that's something that uh, when I was looking at my PhD research, uh, we didn't have a good explanation for. Uh, and so I dove into that and, and wrote a book uh, called Petroaggression, which seeks to explain that phenomenon. And I'll say more about that in just a second. Uh, but let me say, say first uh, about the eight pathways leading from oil to war that we sometimes um, uh, think about in political science, uh, and I'll run through them fairly quickly. Number one is sort of the classic oil war, right, where oil raises the payoff to conquest. Uh, and a good example of this uh, is sometimes um, we think of Iraq invading Kuwait in 1990. Uh, and there's various incentives for this, right? So there's, there's profits, right? And so Saddam Hussein might have been motivated by the idea that Kuwait had lots of deep oil reserves and that he could make some money um, by seizing them. But it's worth pointing out that oil is never the only reason for war. And even that war, uh, the, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait is a complicated one. There are multiple incentives. Uh, and so even this classic definition of oil wars uh, is, is more complicated than it first appears. And in fact, historically, this type of war is quite rare. Um, the, the two most, the clearest cases of this are Japan in World War II and Iraq invading uh, Kuwait in 1990. A second type of oil war, uh, which is more complicated, is the idea that the, there might be a threat to key territories in the oil market which creates a, a global risk, a systemic risk for other states. Uh, and so this is something that we might think of as uh, motivating the US response to Iraq in 1991, uh, having said, listen, you will not take Kuwait and you will not attack Saudi Arabia. Saddam Hussein uh, did both of those things. And so the US, um, led a coalition of international forces against Iraq and forced them to withdraw from Kuwait. And in part, they were doing that not to seize the oil uh, in Kuwait, because in fact, the international coalition turned the oil back in back to Kuwaitis, uh, to Kuwaiti property, but instead um, to make sure that uh, Saddam Hussein could not be a kind of quasi monopolist uh, in the global oil market by having Iraqi oil and Kuwaiti oil and maybe even Saudi oil. That was a concern for the United States and for others uh, as potentially having too much influence on the global oil market. Again, not the only motivation, uh, but part of what was going on in the political calculus. A third pathway, uh, again, something uh, of a concern um, are the presence, military presence often, of foreigners in a petrostate can create grievances inside that petrostate. So for example, uh, Al-Qaeda, which uh, attacked the United States in 2001, September 11th, uh, used the American presence in Saudi Arabia as a recruiting tool for uh, their operations, for, for terrorism. Uh, and so they very explicitly conflated the presence of foreigners, of, of Americans uh, and others, uh, along with economic grievances associated with oil and perceived threats to Islam as a recruiting tool. Uh, so that's, that's another pathway where we can see uh, carbon playing a role in conflict. 
I'm turning now to the producers, so the petrostates. Uh, what about them? Well, I said earlier that there's this phenomenon of petroaggression, where oil gives a lot of money to the leader of petrostates. And uh, unfortunately, that can reduce the accountability of that leader to his own people. Uh, and it's usually him uh, to his own people. And so um, leaders like that are more likely, on average, to get into wars. Because one of the reasons the leaders don't like to get into wars is that if they lose a war, they're very likely to get thrown out of office. But in petrostates, that doesn't happen that in fact they tend, uh, even leaders who have gone to war and lost, they tend to stay in office because they have oil to buy them out of trouble, uh, essentially. And so in particular, where you have a domestic revolution, which often, often produces a kind of a set of aggressive preferences for the state, plus you have oil, then you are very likely to get conflict. And I'll give you one statistical um, uh, result uh, out of that. Uh, here uh, on the left hand side, you've got the gray bars. These are non revolutionary states, uh, and they have low levels of conflict per year, which is what we're, we're measuring on the y axis here. Uh, these are mids in which the state was the attacker per year. Uh, that's the average rate. Uh, and on the, the right hand side, you've got the red bars. These are revolutionary states. They tend to be more aggressive. They get into more uh, uh, conflicts. And in particular, on the farthest uh, right-hand side, you've got petro-revolutionary states, the ones that have both oil and war, and they're very aggressive. They get into a lot of conflict. Um, in particular, countries like, say, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, Iran under the Ayatollahs, or Libya under Gaddafi. These are all good examples of this type of phenomenon. There are other uh, pathways as well. I'm just keeping an eye on time and realizing that I'm out of time almost, so I need to, to wrap up. Uh, but I'll say, I'll highlight number six as uh, another example. Civil wars in, uh, in oil states, in petrostates, tend to become externalized, right? So you have a civil war in petrostates. That, uh, that's uh, something that's unfortunately more common in petrostates than in non-petrostates. Uh, and then those civil wars get uh, externalized. There are a top top couple of other pathways, uh, uh, particularly associated with shipping lanes and pipelines. Uh, so you can think, uh, for instance, of the pipelines through Ukraine and how that's been uh, a focus of conflict with Russia uh, in the past as well. But instead, I'm going to go to conclusions uh, and um, point out uh, that there are these multiple uh, and complex connections between oil and conflict. And so I've identified eight different pathways. Uh, there, there may be more as well, and that's for future research. The point here is that oil is unfortunately uh, a very serious contributor to international conflict. And that's likely to continue for the future, even as oil, we hope, becomes a smaller portion of the global economy it is unlikely to go to zero anytime soon. Uh, that for decades, we can expect oil to be a smaller, but nonetheless very significant portion of the global economy, particularly for things like air travel, where there aren't good alternatives, even with batteries and other types of technologies. But as much as I've emphasized oil today, I wanna to come back to the point that the even more dangerous threat here uh, is the existential threat of climate change. And so we need to work towards polycentric climate solutions, uh, as Eleanor Ostrom encouraged us to do. Thanks so much for having me and uh, uh, happy Earth Day. So very good. We thank Professor uh, Corgan for this uh, contribution, very important, which provided more uh, topics for discussion. And now we have talked about carbon cycle, geopolitics, reserves, resources, and the problem of carbon as a potential conflict element. All of this now is going to be discussed in, the, in this um, panel session, because this morning we wanted to talk about the, the present situation, okay, mainly. And in the afternoon, we look at potential solutions, perspectives for the future and what we have to do now to, to skip this very 
uh, problematic situation we are experiencing in the last several decades. So um, now I'm going to leave the floor to Alessandra Quadrelli, but first let me briefly introduce her as, as the, uh, the chair of the, of, the, um, of the round table. And please also consider that we have proposed you a new question, a new poll uh, regarding the, uh, the next element you'd like to, to, to discuss because we, we, we value your, your uh, suggestion. So, the next, uh, um, the next uh, um, webinar will be either about helium, indium, phosphorus, cobalt, lithium, others. So please suggest, thank you. So let's go back to the round table, uh, which will be led by Alessandra Quadrelli. Alessandra is director of research of the French CNRS at uh, the ESA Lyon Laboratories and chairs of the Lyon Engineering School for Sustainable Development. She serves as associate editor of the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry journal Green Chemistry, and her research focuses on the study of surfaces for heterogeneous catalytic re reduction of nitrogen and carbon dioxide for renewable energy storage. Please, uh, Alessandra, uh, take uh, the microphone and uh, let's go with the uh, roundtable discussion. Thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, I know my audio is not very nice, so please let me know if, um, if the audio is not right. Um, firstly, a really uh, a heartfelt thank you to the UCAMS and uh, in being able to turn a conversation among colleagues, and I'm thinking about David back in Tarragona, into something that I hope benefits the community and allows us to use our collective intelligence to see where we can go and where we can direct our science. I was indeed very impressed by the periodic table that you issued for the international year in 2019, because it was a clear effort to connect our beloved, maybe ontologic uh, periodic table. The carbon reacts like this, has that electronegativity with our human utilization of the elements. And this material approach about our responsibility was what I took as, a, as very important in the periodic table. And I think we're continuing this. So thank you for taking this. Let's focus on, on, on carbon. Um, David has laid the, the, the reasoning behind this discussion very clearly. All our panelists have added um, insight into this. So I would like to ask for the feedback on the um, uh, on the sondage that on the poll that you have exerted, uh, if, if someone from the organization or you, Nicola, later on, uh, can tell us what the 225 participants think about um, this change of colors, and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna start very easily in in polling our panelists about what their perception is about this change in color. Uh, if I may have another pitch into this is the merit of the periodic table is to inject accountability in our practices as chemists and chemist engineers. We know how to transform elements. Now we have to question, is it right to do so? What am I doing when I use something? Where does it come from and where does it go? So. This idea of accountability is this idea of changing the color and, and showing that we're aware and that we care. So um, I very much like the proposal or do something a little more sophisticated than just black or orange that David put through, but um, I will go through the speakers maybe and ask uh, Mark Schaffer maybe to share with us his position on this suggestion. Oh my, okay. Uh, definitely, definitely at least orange. Absolutely. It's because exactly because of the point you raised in the letter that you, you and your co-authors wrote. Um, I'm not sure about black, however, because it, I, I would want to, and I haven't done this, I would want to look at how much fossil fuel is generated by countries or in countries where there is no conflict versus how much is, is, is conflict related. Um, I haven't done it. I would, it, it, of course, it depends how you define conflict, I suppose. But I, 
offhand, I'd be surprised if it was a majority related to conflict. I, I, I haven't done it, but in, of course, it depends on how you define conflict. But, but in the absence of it being um, uh, so, I, I would to to label it conflict related. I would want the majority of use to be somehow potentially conflict related. Thank you very much for this input. Maybe we can continue the roundtable. Pierre Fridlingsen, would you like to contribute to this and share your opinion? Uh, yes. Uh, can, can you hear? Can you hear me? Well, uh, I guess I, I don't have a strong opinion. Uh, I think it, it makes sense to move it maybe to orange, but I mean, my reservation is, I mean, the issue is not carbon, the issue is CO2. So carbon as an element is fine, and you can find carbon in many other, I mean, combination and molecule, like, like I mean, I mean, ca, 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 uh, ca, ca, calcium carbonate, sorry, um, CSU3, which is found in the ocean and in soils, and it's absolutely fine. It's inert. It's there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with CSU3. It's only well, it's mainly CO2, as we discussed this morning, and well, a bit of methane as well, which is issue. So, I mean, even for CO2, I mean, we have. I mean, many, many discussions with, I mean, with climate deniers, they say, well, the CO2 is good for the planet. I mean, CO2 is good for plants and ecosystems and plant ecosystems and humans do, do need CO2. So there's nothing wrong with CO2. So we, we keep I mean, reminding them, yes, yes, it is, this is true, but at the same time, CO2 is a problem for, for, the, for the climate system and the climate response. So having like a black or white or black, orange, green signal, it's, it's good because it it, 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 it it does inform that there is the threat, there is a problem, but it's it's not a binary uh, system. And as I said initially, I mean carbon alone as a as a as an element is is not problematic. It's the combination with oxygen as CO2. Very good. I continue my round table with uh, David, maybe. We, we can't hear you. Uh, can you can hear me now? Yep. Yes, I can hear you. All right, good. So um, I was suggesting maybe David can tell us what this presentation. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share my screen just for a minute, if I may, Alessandro. Um, oh, crumbs. Which one is it now? That one, I think. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so these are the suggestions that were made just now. Alessandra's the original one at the top and then uh, the two that I made in the presentation. Uh, the point about conflict minerals, of course, is that uh, no element only comes from places where there are conflicts. So tantalum, tungsten, tin, gold all come from other places. So it doesn't have to be even a majority that comes. It's just ones that are coming from mainly in this case, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where people do fight wars over the mines or the proceeds of the mines are used to fight wars. And we had a very eloquent exposition from uh, Professor Brown just a few minutes ago, uh, who is, no, sorry, was that his name? No, Col Colburn, sorry. Um, saying exactly that, that there are many wars fought over oil. So. That's why I would think that black is definitely should be there. Um, I, I'm slightly swinging between the two, whether it should be only orange or green and orange, because uh, although there is plenty of carbon dioxide and there's plenty of calcium carbonate, it's still a problem because there's too much carbon dioxide. And it's a question of whether we acknowledge it as being OK or not OK and orange would be not okay, green would be okay. So I think there's a, a, a debate to be had there. And, and so uh, I think we, we should hear the views of people of that. Thank you, David. Uh, Nicola, would you care to uh, tell us more? Yes, I can tell you the results of the poll, which are very interesting. And we had, uh, 136 uh, voters, and uh, uh, we have several options. So uh, in the fourth position, it's only green. So 
12% of the people ask it to keep it as it is, 12%, okay? Then 17%, they suggest green and black. And then 28% suggests, suggest uh, green and stripes as uh, shown by uh, one of the options shown by, by, by David. And finally, the winner is, is orange and black, 39%. So our audience has a very strong opinion that <laughs> it should be, uh, green should disappear overall and only orange and black should appear. I just can make a consideration as it was uh, uh, said by Mark, it, it pretty much depends on how we define a conflict. But if we look at the three largest oil producers, which is US, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, uh, it is uh, undeniable that all of them have been involved in the last at least 10 years, or even in the past in wars, because I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Crimea, and, um, and the Yemen, and you know, so that's, <laughs> it, it depends on, on what we consider an oil war, certainly the, probably the Russian, uh, part of the Russian uh, related conflicts are not related directly to oil, but it's an internal uh, um, business, but it's, it's, it's a country that is involved in wars as well. So that's, that's probably, probably our strong opinion of our uh, uh, voters uh, today, of our uh, audience is uh, in a way uh, well-funded. Thank you, Nicola. I was hoping maybe Floris would like to um, uh, intervene if he has an opinion he would like to share. Yeah, I, I actually voted for keeping green in the uh, as a color, uh, but uh, I actually liked the the suggestion with the, with the uh, so the combination of green and orange with the black stripes, which is a combination that actually was not in the poll. But um, yeah, I, I see all the arguments, and um, I I think the black should also definitely be there, but because it is it is uh, as we have seen a conflict uh, element, but I would hesitate to leave the gr the green away. I must say. Yes, David. As Floris points out, there, there were the two which had three colors in them weren't in the poll. There was a, a block for others, but people tend not to tick that box. Uh, is there a possibility of repeating the poll with all the possibilities in it, uh, perhaps over lunchtime? Yeah, sure we can. Uh, at the secretariat, they can make it. If I may continue along this line, I've also heard important um, comments. Um, well, the first thing is the consensus that the, the discussion we're having today is a discussion that makes sense to most of the people here, and that indeed just beaming carbon as green, at least for the, the, the majority of us, um, could hamper the way the chemical community is perceived as not in touch with serious chemistry also related, we're not responsible, but we're able to see it in a chemical way, uh, related around this carbon budget. So, um, Floris, you gave your vote about the green, but you opened up to the idea that we might uh, take this opportunity to, to actually share with the world that we're in touch with this idea that, that uh, carbon is just not a, a wonderful element that allows us to do many things, but, but is also at the key of the CO2 problem and, and, and many others. So this yeah. is the first major consensus. Yeah, carbon, car carbon I, I would say, has different phases. But as an organic chemist, uh, um, I mean, carbon is for, to me is the most important and the most precious element. So I, I would say let's also keep it keep it partially green. Absolutely, I think this is this is 
actually what is really important about this periodic table is that we're able to inject um, our usages in a global way and not just our, 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 our capacity to, to, to make molecules. We're, we're injecting it in geopolitics, in economics, in, in climate. So, so I like this, this opening. So this is the consensus for sure. Another thing that I've heard and, and that actually goes along things that, that seems relevant is that question were raised about what is the proportion this is how we feel after one hour and a half, two hour, very dense information, but we probably need to, to make a collective efforts to turn this into a, 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 a crunched number. What I mean is the following, is that the foundation of the year, the scarcity table was crust abundance and atmosphere. And that was a very, sturdy way of starting. But we're seeing that actually the inventories are not sufficient if we just look at crusts and in the atmosphere. So we need to enlarge our inventory to, to geological storage and, and oil wells and, and all the presentation of Mark Schaefer. So there's a work there. At the end of the line, there's also the idea that carbon is not only used in petrochemicals, it's used also in textiles. It's used also in paper and pulp. And we have to see the numbers. A, a back of the envelope shows that oil is the winner on, on all of these inventories. But we could actually maybe do this work of, of uh, answering the question raised by Mark or, or raised also by Pierre, how much? What is the proportion? How do we measure it? And, and, and working around this. So that's, that's also a way of, of taking this forward and inviting the UCAMs, starting with carbon and then opening to the other elements to make an inventory that goes beyond cross an atmosphere and that goes into real usage, human usage, global usage of this source. David, would you like to react to this? Sandra, Sandra, there are two people wanting to, to speak, Mark and Nicola. Uh, Sorry, I, I don't see the raised hands. Why don't you help me? So Mark Schaefer first and then Nicola afterwards. Yeah, please. Uh, okay, I'm speaking as a, as a non-chemist. It's been not quite half a century since I studied chemistry. Um, but I think the... <laughs> I think the problem you have is that the periodic table is a periodic table of elements and um, carbon is one of those elements that doesn't get used as an element, it gets used as a molecule in molecules and those molecules are all across the board. Um, uh, we wouldn't be here <laughs> without them. And uh, I think uh, for, since this is, this is meant for consumption by non-chemist, you, for better or worse, carbon is a shorthand for for CO2 and and the issues related to climate change, and I and and that's a choice that you're that that is sort of made for you, and you're and and the, we're here discussing it in those terms. Um, so yeah, that's all. Yes, and now I want to to make a a, a comment as a chemist. This came from several discussions with colleagues here in Italy. And uh, the point is we, we don't have as chemists to demonize carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is the key molecule of the carbon cycle, especially for the biosphere. So it's a kind of currency for the, for the, for the, for the um, uh, carbon cycle. It's, it's the workhorse of, of the carbon cycle. So with no carbon dioxide, no life on this planet. So, you have to be careful of that. So the problem is not carbon dioxide. The problems are human beings. Okay, so let's 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 clarify this. Um, and the other point is a question to 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 Mark. Um, you you pointed out very clearly the difference between res reserves and resources. And uh, the key point is reserves. So at the very end, what is interesting is reserves. But uh, as far as I understood in in, in across many years that there are no 
established international criteria to determine the resources. So basically every country or every company declares what they want. So is this a problem in the discussion, in the conversation about, about oil, uh, carbon dioxide emission and decarbonization? So we don't know exactly what we have because there is no international standard. Um, should I answer now? Yeah. Um, it, 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 in a way, it's even worse than that because there are incentives for these actors to report as reserves numbers that are favorable to them. Uh, the, um, the, the, the best example is how um, OPEC production um, quotas are related to reserves. And of course, it, you'll, if, you, if you think you can get a higher production quota by reporting larger reserves, well, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but this is, um, I, I don't think this is a fundamental problem in how we, in, in terms of debate and assessment, it's just, it, it's like, um, you know, how do, how, do, how do people in the business world, world value companies when companies are supposed to be reporting assets according to certain criteria, but then sometimes they, they get up to things and they misreport or try to hide stuff and then they go bankrupt and so forth. Um, and this is, you know, it, it's just part of part of you know how we get it getting on. I don't think it's a it, it's a fundamental problem. Um, we we know more or less where where we stand and and what's at stake. Um, and uh, this and the, the the it 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 doesn't change the punchline that we finished our slides with, which is the the scarce resource is the capacity to deal with with this global climate change problem, and it's not the ability to extract the resources. Yeah, has his hand up, Alessandra. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, I also just want to comment on on, on the issue of resource, and I, I I fully agree with what I mean David just said, and I think Nicola, the, the, the problem is not how much resource we have, the problem is I mean how, how how can we make sure we don't use them in the near future? I mean we have too much resource, I mean to bridge the one point five or two degree, I mean I mean I mean warming level. This is for, this is for sure. So the key question is, I mean, how do we manage in the coming decades? It has to happen very quickly. How do we manage to reduce the use of resource in the near term? Uh, I, I think this opportunity to ask one question to Pierre. It's about uh, methane. You mentioned it. Uh, unfortunately, in Europe and probably everywhere in the world, uh, methane emissions are only estimated and not measured. So what is the situation? Is the situation evolving and improving about what we know about methane? Because the other bad guy is methane and methane is related to the, to the, internal, uh, to the international uh, uh, shipping and, and, and trade of, of, of natural gas, which, which tra travels thousands of kilometers across continents. And, and it's a gas and it's, it's very difficult to, to keep it where it should stay. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, well, I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on, on methane emissions, but I mean, there are many different sources of methane emissions. And as you see, they're not reported as well and accurately than, I mean, fossil fuel emissions. And sources are mainly coming from agricultures uh, and land use. Uh, I mean, uh, and the way they are being estimated at the moment is following, I mean, guidelines from IPCCs and which are essentially some kind of like bookkeeping based on well cattle, amount of cattle, and this so I mean and, and extension of I mean rice paddies and 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 these sort of things and they are not they are not directly reported they are like they are derived from other quantities that we we we, we do report so there's large uncertainty and we don't fully understand the global methane cycle. I mean, when you do the sum of all emissions reported by countries and all the things in the atmospheres and in the soils, it doesn't match up. There's, the, there's, there's, the, there's, a, there's a mismatch in the budget. We observe methane increasing in the atmosphere and we can't fully explain the growth rate of methane from year to year. As, as, you, as you may know, I mean, methane stopped increasing for about 10 years, I mean, about 20 years ago with no clear explanation. It starts regrowing again. And yeah, it's, it's much more complex than CO2 because the, so, the sources are much more diverse. There are smaller sources, but everyone counts. So the accounting of methane, it, it, it is it's still problematic, I agree.
Thank you. Yes, David. Can I just make a comment on Mark's, uh, the thing you said about carbon is an element in the periodic table, but it's its uses that are important. But that's true of all the elements in the periodic table, and they're all used in different ways. And so we're not trying to say this element as an element is the problem. It's this element in its compounds and as they're used. And so that's in a way why, but carbon is more complicated because it is used in so many different ways. I mean, indium has maybe 10 major uses. Carbon may have 40,000, 100,000, a million, I don't know. And you think of all the biomass out there, it's just completely different. So in a way we should try to encapsulate that by maybe making it the three different colors. If we feel that the green, in some sense, as Nicola says, carbon dioxide is the most important chemical in the world. Uh, one of them, oxygen is quite important for us to breathe and magnesium is important for converting it and so on, but it is a very, very important uh, compound. So, I mean, I suppose that's what I think. In reply to you, Alessandro, you're asking about making an inventory of everything. Is, is that not, in fact, already done to some extent somewhere? Somebody must know all of that, do they? Um, you, you made a, a, a wonderful work about, uh, as you can, about being this messenger between what is out there and is, is, is known and what we can, we can actually uh, share as a community in a readable way. So I am sure it's out there and, and to take some of the comments that are in the question in A that we cannot address, I invite everybody to read. There are a lot of very uh, insightful comments uh, and, and uh, it's a little bit of frustration of, of, of this seminar that we cannot restitute everything. So please read the comments. But to come back to your question, yes, it's out there. And I think that at the end of this work, we will come to the conclusion that indeed we have to take petrol and oil and fossil resources as the main contributor to this carbon cycle and that we have to take CO2 as the main output of this carbon cycle in the anthropogenic activities. But we can do the work of summarizing it and explaining why uh, we decide if we decide, as I think, to, to evolve from this move along. There's no problem with carbon uh, management on a global level and uh, to something that is a little more, I feel, in touch with, with the questions that are actually um, interesting a big chunk of, of the society and should do so. Um, with respect to conflict, I think it's at least it's not readily available out there to know what portion of fossil fuel are connected to conflict areas. I think Jeff Colgan's presentation clearly showed that there is a level of, of connection. How much is that? How do we handle that? How do we handle that in the periodic table? I think it's going to be very nourishing um, exchanges and we can make the work. Yes. And David, if you could please give the word, my version of Zoom does not show the, the hand thing. So <laughs> please do that. Your audio. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, with regard to conflict, of course, it, it, it's not so much the amount of it, it's the fact that it is there. And the, but, the, but the real question is, how do you deal with it if you decide it's a conflict mineral? The way a phone company deals with tantalum is it doesn't buy it from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. If we decide that oil in Saudi Arabia is funding attacks on Yemen, do we ban purchases of oil from Saudi Arabia? That would be the logical conclusion. Now, that's not really for us to decide, that's for other people to decide, but it's something we should perhaps make a recommendation on. I, I, I would like to also to bounce back if no one else wants the word to, to, to stress one of the things also that have been said that actually one of the conclusion also of uh, on the effect I hope of this webinar is to see what recommendation are we going to make? What is this going to induce? Uh, 
you have just spoken about the facts of uh, war-related and conflicts. There is also the aspect of CO2, and it seems that one of the logical uh, connection is how can we favor the injection of renewable energy in our energy system? Because that, has, as, as Pierre was saying, is, is one way of actually re, re, reorganizing this cycle in a way that, that we emit less CO2 and, and that orange tinge goes closer to green. I, 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 I like the, the suggestion that I've read from Christophe Copperet, one of the members of, uh, of the team that has worked on the periodic table about the Janus representation, this mythological figure with two heads that is able to do good. That's also food for thought about how we can integrate that. Obviously, we do not want to demonize carbon. Carbon is central to our life, but we don't want even to make it a, a non-important topic to address. I give the floor back to Nicole and Flores as the, the, the headmasters of today's to see how they want to bring through this idea. I think we can conclude with the idea that there is an idea of, of how should I say, a consensus around this being a relevant topic, about this being something that, that is worth um discussing and maybe showing to the public by a change of color david wants to add a couple of words just before that mark has his hand up and Sorry, then... mark. yes please oh, oh there was a it, only if it's appropriate there was a question asked in the q a that about developing countries that somebody asked and me specifically i wonder if i could address can i oh okay right right okay um the, the the question was what what can we do uh, with respect to developing countries and i'll follow a chain of reasoning like this um the the rich oecd countries um got rich by uh, with a uh, 150 years of industrialization and pumping massive amounts of co2 into the atmosphere so the reason we have a problem today is not because of developing countries who are going to be become rich and in principle could put even more CO2 in. The reason we have a problem today is because we put it there. And so following from that reason, reasoning, I think we have a moral obligation. More, this is a sort of moral reasoning to, to think about things like direct air capture and actually actively removing it from the atmosphere, not because it would allow us to uh, you know, put, put more in elsewhere, but um, uh, be, through not because it would uh, give us a, a, a bigger budget, because we should be undoing, we should be moral, sort of world moral leaders, and uh, trying to undo the damage that we've that we've that we've done. Um, and uh, we, if if we tell if we tell developing countries you shouldn't become you shouldn't be industrializing and increasing your energy use and so forth, because we already did it and we got there first, and too, it's too late for you. That's that's not going to work. Um, Uh, there is one one hand. Yes, yep. you wanted yeah. to add something. Yeah, well, just I, I I'm reading the chat and then there's one suggestion in the chat from Anna Charas, suggesting maybe we need a different color, and I, I kind of agree with the suggestion. I mean, the the problem is not. I mean, the the scarcity of carbon. There's no scarcity of carbon. There's plenty of carbon in, on in on on Earth, in in many different different forms, as we discussed. I mean, the problem with carbon is CO two and CO two. I mean, released by human activities. So I mean, she was suggesting maybe we can you can introduce like a new color, like violet, violet for example, or any color, which bring attention to another issue, which is not related really to how much carbon is left in the system, how much carbon we need to use, but it's more related to I mean, the risk of using CO two and releasing CO two into the atmosphere. In and I quite like it. This is this is actually one of the options that that we had discussed with David, and I think it got lost. In the two years, uh, in the two years uh, organization of this, but and actually purple <laughs> was the color we we mentioned. So so yep. this could be this could be something to be to be thought about as as a proposal that you can go through. I I take up your suggestion, Alessandro, to, to to say something also because we are at the end of our time slot. 
uh, the procedure normally that we, we want to, to follow is that we take up all the suggestions from the audience from today and even from the next uh, days and weeks because people uh, continue to interact with us also through social media or YouTube or whatever. So, um, and then we discuss internally as a task group uh, in the next, uh, within uh, the next few weeks or a few months. And then uh, as, as an executive board, we will discuss it and take a decision possibly by the end of the year in view of, 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 of the new version of the periodic table because it was issued in uh, 2019. So our idea is to make a revised version every two, three, four years. So maybe three years could be an, a, a, an interval which is reasonable. So maybe next year, three years after the first uh, publication, we can, we can come up with the new color following up all the discussion and input and suggestion that we have. The, the, the uh, different color is, yes, as you said, Alessandra, is one of the ideas that we already discussed among us and it could be possibly a reasonable solution. But anyway, I leave the, the, the stage to Floris, the, our president for the final words of this morning's session. Okay, well, I, I, I will be very brief. Um, but I think this was um, um, a, a, a very interesting and diverse discussion on the, the various phases of, of carbon, and it has given us, uh, uh, well, a better view, I think, how to proceed with uh, carbon in the, in the periodic table. Um, so I would like to close here. Thank all the speakers for their contributions. It was really uh, useful and very interesting. Thank you very much for that. And then uh, we'll uh, reconvene uh, or we'll recontinue the, the program at, uh, at 1.30. Thank you very much. <laughs>